the uh, the amount of attendees that have responded. It's great. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So just let a few more people get in before we get started. Last chance for uh, for water and snacks. <laughs> so I saw a question. Uh, will this event be recorded and available online after the event? It will. Uh, I'll go over that in a sec. Thanks, Don. All right. So hi, and welcome uh, everyone to Telefilm Canada's webinar session of Film Festival Distribution, a conversation with Sean Farnell. We are happy to see so many of you could join us today and we wanna thank you for your time. I'm Ken Peru, I'm Director of Events Management at Telefilm Canada, and uh, I'll be helping with moderation today. Um, I'd like to take this uh, time, a moment to acknowledge that the Telefilm Canada Montreal office, the office that I work from, is situated in the traditional and unceded territory of the Ganyan Gehaga, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. I say all this to practice gratitude for the land and pay respect to the lineage of Indigenous peoples who have lived in right relations with the land for thousands of years. I would also like to acknowledge that you may be joining us today from different places, near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Whatever path has brought you to this land that you are currently on, I encourage you to reflect on your relationship to it today and how your experience with it may differ from those around you. For those of you who don't know, Telefilm Canada is a crown corporation dedicated to the development, financing, and promotion of Canadian film and creators. We are more than 200 passionate experts from coast to coast, contributing to the success of the industry, both nationally and globally. So before this presentation begins, I'd just like to go through a couple of housekeeping notes. So simultaneous translation in French and English is available via Zoom. So by clicking on the globe icon that you should see in your screen, um, this session, and Don asked this question earlier, this session will be recorded and published on Telefilm's website, as well as on our YouTube channel. So soon after uh, today's, uh, today's event. Um, we have reserved 30 minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A. So questions can be written in both French and English. You can use the Q&A function. So if you look at the bottom of the Zoom, you have the chat and the Q&A. Use the Q&A to ask your questions. Um, but also, please, please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, throughout Sean's speech. And, um, and Sean will be checking in uh, kind of uh, freestyle during his, uh, his presentation. And if, if something is, is pertinent at the time, he'll, he'll answer it on the spot. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are in a safe space here. Your opinions and comments matter. So please feel free to, to ask as many questions as you want. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce, introduce uh, Sean Farnell. Sean provides creative marketing and distribution services to documentary producers, companies, and institutions. Today, you'll discuss the role of festivals play in marketing, sales, and distribution for independent films. So without further ado, please take it away, Sean. <laughs> thanks, Ken. Um, and thanks, everyone at Telefilm <clears throat> for hosting this panel. It looks like it's a pretty popular session because we're all trying to figure out uh, film festivals these days, especially. And this is what I do on a daily basis, working with independent producers, uh, director producers, and, and trying to figure out the festival landscape and, and how that, um, you know, how supports getting a film out there into the world and landing with audiences. Um, so, uh, First of all, I should say I have a, uh, I don't have an actual wall of VHS tapes behind me. It's a very tenuous green screen that hopefully holds up uh, through this uh, seminar. I wish I had a wall of VHS tapes uh, behind me. Um, and uh, today I am going to take you through how I figure out uh, marketing and distribution strategies for independent films. Uh, mostly uh, I deal with documentaries, but most of what I'm going to uh, run through with you today uh, applies to independent fiction uh, films uh, as well. And uh, what you might be saying right now is like, whoa, I signed up for a, a, a film festival uh, webinar here. You're talking about marketing and distribution. 
And that's my kind of first and most important point is that film festivals are marketing and distribution. Um, and, and distribution means uh, uh, both sales to other businesses and, and of course, theatrical exhibition to, to audiences. And that's how I approach film festivals. Uh, we market the film, we market ourselves as professionals. Uh, we sell our products, uh, both to other companies and to the film festival's consumer audiences. So uh, film festivals are our industry and, and co industry conferences and, and markets. And, and they're also the largest worldwide exhibition circuit for independent films. And, and that's how I look at it. And, and uh, now uh, in these times, uh, there are also consumer facing uh, VOD platforms. Uh, and, and we'll get to that uh, as well and, and what to think through in terms of thinking of festivals has VOD platforms. Um, and uh, the other thing, you know, I have to totally acknowledge here is that, um, you know, there's the way film festivals functioned in, in sort of BC times uh, before COVID. And there's going to be the way film festivals function uh, after COVID, whenever that happens. And, and, and they'll be different uh, for sure. We're already seeing this notion of a hybrid type film festival, which I believe uh, vestiges of, I believe, will stick around. A half hybrid is kind of here to stay. Um, uh, but right now, like everything else, there, there is kind of chaos and, and confusion and uncertainty on the film festival circuit. Uh, obviously, uncertainty kind of equals anxiety. And it is like everything else, the age of anxiety for, for film festivals. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was kind of getting ready and thinking I was going to go to IDFA, the large documentary film festival in Amsterdam, kind of like the can for documentaries. And then the Dutch government announced a new set of restrictive orders and, and, a, and a lockdown. And, and, and so I, I didn't go. A lot of people did go um, still, um, but part of the festival happened online. My part, I did some consultations online. Um, we thought earlier this year that, um, you know, by the fall festival season, Venice, TIFF, Telluride, things would be kind of back to so-called normal. Obviously, that didn't happen. Americans went to tell, tell a ride. Europeans did go to Venice. Really, you know, the industry did not show up at, at TIFF this year. Um, then we thought, okay, Sundance, Berlin, and Rotterdam. Well, Sundance is preparing for a, a hybrid event. Rotterdam today announced that the industry component is going to be online. Berlin is up in the air. So um, these are the times we're in now, and all of us that are working with and for and need film festivals is a crucial part of our business are really figuring out things as we go. So that's sort of my, my preface. Uh, but let's sort of, I'm gonna sort of start at the beginning in terms of the kinds of things um, you need to start thinking about and when you start you need to start thinking about them. And then we'll just sort of run through the whole process. And as Ken mentioned, you know, this is kind of built as a, a conversation. It's, it's hard to do with 200 people, but I'm certainly keeping an eye on the questions and answers. And I'm gonna weave some of, some of the answers to those questions in as I'm speaking here. Um, I'm also very open to very specific questions. Like if you're grappling with, do I premiere here or there? You know, I'm, I'm, up, I'm open to sort of jamming on and workshopping some very specific questions. So feel free to sort of outline those in, in the Q&A as well. I'm going to try to uh, be uh, slow uh, and be mindful of the fact that um, I'm being translated here. I tend to like, so like slow me down when you when you need to and, and, and ask me to repeat things if, if I'm going too fast. And I'm going to run you through some very specific examples and how I sort of think through film festival strategies and how I track festivals and give you some also some tools to you know do research and etc. So you know, I'll just sort of start really at the beginning. And, and the first thing is, you know, when should I start thinking about film festivals? And, and, and as I said, um, it's marketing and distribution. And you should be thinking about marketing and distribution when you're developing and financing your film. This stuff should be built into the DNA in any production these days. It can't be an afterthought. And building that in means also building a budget. As an independent producer, building in a launch budget for your film. Um, and thinking about, is this a festival film? Uh, 
you know, that's a broad question and uh, we can sort of, I can play with that a bit later, but do we need festivals on the business end to sell us film? Do we need festivals to test the market? What are we going to use festivals for? All this thinking, like all thinking around how you market and distribute an independent production, really, in my, in my view, needs to be considered very early in the process. Um, so there's that. Build it into the DNA of, of your film. Um, when do you really need to get serious about it? Well, I would suggest at around rough cut stage, fine cut stage, um, you're starting to get feedback, you're starting to have a finish line, and you're starting to think, okay, what's our premiere window here? If you're finishing a film, um, for instance, in the, in the spring, you have a lot and finish, I mean, a lot picture and you're ready for external people like film festival programmers to start considering your film. Then in the spring, you're looking at, you know, the deadlines for the fall season, um, the big festivals like TIFF, Venice, Telluride, um, and, a, and really a robust, robust Canadian circuit. So really the fall is, is the optimal time in Canada, certainly, to, to launch a film on the festival circuit. There's 10 to 15 film festivals happening between really September and uh, the end of October. Um, so uh, if you're finishing a film, let's say in the fall season, well, uh, you know, you want to sort of be mindful of the Sundance deadlines. They're kind of in August, um, the last deadlines, um, you know, you want to be submitting uh, in around that window. So when are we finished? And I mean, finished, you have a locked picture, you're not still moving structural pieces of the film around. And uh, when are we finished a film so that it um, can be considered properly? And we'll, when will we be ready? They, those could be two very different questions. You could have a locked picture and be ready to submit to film festivals, but you might not be ready in terms of the business of marketing and selling a film to be launching a film in January at Sundance. You might not be ready till the spring, like Hot Docs or can if you're a feature film or La Carna later in the summer. So when are you truly ready to market and distribute the work is also a part of that, that, that thinking. And you're starting to think of those things when you're around rough cut, fine cut stage. Um, uh, let me look at the questions. We're gonna we're talking about features, but all this applies mainly, but all this applies to shorts. And when I show you some examples of a strategy, I'll use uh, shorts. Um, and then some of the other questions I'll get to later. So Emily, that's your question answered around. Uh, we're gonna be talking about shorts too. And, and I'm happy to uh, address any questions specific to the short uh, film festival circuit. Um, okay, and then so like, what the when is, uh, when are when are you done and when are you ready in terms of your marketing and distribution plan and the resources needed to execute a film festival market launch, um, which includes a budget to do so. Um, why is another big question. Why are we, you know, why do we need film festivals? There are a, a lot of different whys, you know. Typically, there's been the notion that we need film festivals to sell uh, our movie, uh, so, you know, you might have Canadian distribution figure out, figured out, but um, you know, can we, you know, we need, we need to go to a, a, a festival to sell our film internationally. And that's true. If you get into TIFF or Cannes or Berlin or a handful of other uh, markets, or if you're a documentary, uh, you get into Hot Docs or IDFA and a handful, there are only probably about 10 film festivals where being at that film festival uh, helps in some way support sales. Most of the other film festivals, the 95 to 99 percent of them, um, they're not markets. They're not places where people go to, to buy and sell film. So in that sense, um, you're looking at a festival strategy that is just around raising awareness around the production gathering some laurels and other things to help uh, you with the kind of equity, the leverage that you have to sell the film, which you're gonna be doing independent of film festivals. Um, so that's one thing. Maybe you're premiering a film, a film at a film festival, just kind of test the market and you have another sales plan. 
Um, do we are we doing a kind of full publicity launch at a film festival at the film festival? Well, is that part of our plan? Well, um, if you haven't done the business of selling your film to theatrical distributors or even VOD streaming platforms, etc., you're probably not going to be doing a lot of publicity at a, at, a, at, a, at a film festival because you want to hold that publicity and those resources and that coverage until you're doing theatrical distribution or exhibition. Your distributor will want to have those PR hits available. They won't, they don't, they won't want coverage exhausted on film festivals. So that's part of a, that's part of a strategy. Um, besides the business of selling and marketing your film production, what other opportunities are available at this festival for me? Am I going to be able to go there and help with uh, you know, development, finance, and pitching on other productions. This is especially true just to get to the short film question. If you have a short film at a film festival, especially if it's at a major film festival where there's a large market component there, you're gonna to wanna to use that opportunity to, uh, to, if you're able to be present at the film festival, which right now is, is not likely. Um, but in times when you can actually attend these festivals, Short films are great uh, keys to the festival in the sense that you can attend event, an event like Berlin or Sundance or TIFF, the large market event can with a short film and use it to cultivate networks, financing, do pitching for, for future uh, feature films. And this is a, a, this is a great uh, reason why uh, you know, it's good to have short films out there in the world, especially if you're a new or, or, or emerging filmmaker. Um, I'm get, yeah, there's a number of questions pulling up and I'll get to those. Don't worry, I'm keeping an eye on all this stuff. Um, so I just want to sort of run over some of the general philosophical considerations before we get into the nuts and bolts. So you figured out your festival window, what your time is going to be. You figured out in, in your, you figured out your intent. Why do we need festivals? Um, why are we going to make this investment in time and money to submit to film festivals? Um, you figured out your intent. It's because we're going to sell a film, or it's because we want the networking, or we want the we want the laurels, or we just want to do outreach and impact. And I'll go through some specific examples in a moment. And then you're going to start your submissions. And and so the first thing to do again, when I said set aside a budget when you're as part of your production. It costs at least $1,500 just to test the waters in terms of film festival submission fees. If you average out, um, let's say you do 50 festival submission fees, you can count on an average price over 50 festivals of about $50. That's $2,500. That would be um, a kind of average budget, a minimal budget, $1,500. A saturation budget is probably about five thousand dollars, so you got a budget for this as well in advance because it's going to cost you a bit of money to to submit to film festivals. Um, um, and uh, and I'm, this is where I'm going to start to get into like some nuts and bolts stuff. So I'm going to share a screen here. Let me just take a look at the questions that are coming in. Okay, Oops, sorry. I got it. Okay, I'll get to these. These are all easy ones to answer. I'll be back to you on that in a second. So first I'm gonna share a screen because I just wanna sort of bring you through the timeline here and then I'll plug in some answers to these questions as we go along. So what I'm gonna share with you here is a kind of uh, some note, a sample of some notes that I do when I'm working with producers around figuring out what to do in terms of festivals. And these notes are available uh, in a report in this film that I've done for DOC that was partially funded by Telefilm. And, and in that report, and I think the link is gonna be shared with you here, uh, there's French and English versions of that report you can download. And that report is um, several case studies around festival distributions and some general thoughts around festivals. So that might be useful as a resource for you. But let me now share my screen and just sort of show you what, um, how I sort of do it in terms of uh, running down. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that now. If not, someone please let me know. Uh, these are notes I prepared for a documentary called How to Be. 
that came out, I think in around 2018, 2019. I came into this film a little later in the game. It's a feature length documentary made by uh, uh, a Whitehorse based director, Naomi Mark and produced uh, by Naomi and her part and uh, producing partner Vivian on this film. It premiered at the Available Light Film Festival, a lovely, lovely event in, in Whitehorse. Uh, so they had a hometown premiere and they came to me after having um, not had so much luck with uh, their festival plan. So this is what I call a kind of triage approach where I'm trying to kind of regroup the filmmakers around uh, how to sort of regroup with festivals, et cetera. So you saw here, you see here, they've come to me and, they, and they've, they've had a significant volume of, of, of declination, rejection letters from major festivals. They did have their premiere set at Available Light, which is where I met them. And they were also invited to play at a festival uh, in Vancouver, a documentary festival called Doxa in early May. Um, and, and I want to just sort of scroll down here. And, and uh, what we first thing we do here is start to turn this film into an object in the world. What is it? What are we dealing with here? And I, you know, there's the first, the business aspect of it. What's the right situation of this film? For instance, here the Canadian rights were held by Knowledge Network. So we had to clarify, you know, the holdbacks, what our festival would, window would be. They had uh, worldwide rights were available and held by the producers. So um, that became, okay, well, um, let's try to get into festivals to stimulate some worldwide sales. Um, they had some marketing and uh, infrastructure done and, and they had some goals around how they wanted to release this film. They wanted to be on screen, on big screens because it is a very impressionistic, beautiful film. It's a, a father, daughter story. Um, Naomi's father is a beekeeper. You see him pictured here. He had a chronic lung illness. Naomi returned home to Whitehorse to live with him for, uh, you know, a, a, a difficult time in his life. And, and during that time, he taught her beekeeping. Um, so, you know, I have to give at this point a, a really sort of a, as much as I can and as a consultant an objective assessment of this film. I thought it was a really engaging, tender, moving family stories, beautiful characters in a beautiful setting. It had this long unfolding durational narrative that really pulled you in. Um, it, it was interesting. We learned things about uh, beekeeping. It was also very reflexive um, in terms of Naomi was learning beekeeping as she was filmmaking and there's thoughts about reflexivity about filmmaking there. And it also like um, was interesting in terms of a lifestyle, uh, bee ecology, uh, wellness, et cetera. So those were, I thought, were the strengths of the film. And there's, then there's the part where I said, okay, what's the, you know, I try to anticipate what's the resistance gonna be out there? What are the obstacles maybe to, to getting full appreciation for this really beautiful work? Uh, you know, and this one was a little bit between genres. Um, so uh, we were gonna have to, understand that, uh, you know, people that wanted a beekeeping movie might be thinking, well, this isn't that much about beekeeping, et cetera. So we're gonna have to think about how we wrote about the film, how we framed the film in terms of like, uh, really letting people know what it was about. It was a very quiet, kind of leisurely paced, kind of modest film in terms of its pacing. It's an attention economy out there. One of the big struggles that, um, uh, we all have in terms of getting attention on our work is the fact that, you know, if I'm a film festival programmer or any kind of industry gatekeeper, I have a lot of stuff to watch. I'm sitting here now, we're all sitting here. Yeah, we have big monitors and everything, but maybe we got a film open on Vimeo over here and maybe we've got an eye on our email over there. It's tough. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and so you want to sort of, I always worry about the slower paced films in terms of the attention they're going to get. And, and there are ways to sort of like frame the film, uh, you know, on your film freeway page or whatever the submission is in terms of like the synopsis. And that's important. Just set up a little frame so that when a, a, pro, a festival programmer or any of the gatekeepers like give this film some attention, you know, like it's a, you know, it's, uh, it needs, it needs to be watched. Um, 
they had a marketing strategy that uh, was really dependent on being in festivals and they weren't getting into, into festivals. So that was a problem <laughs> uh, in terms of like uh, executing their impact campaign. And um, then, you know, because the film was in between genres, uh, is it a beekeeping film? Is it a lung film? We had to think through, uh, you know, whether, uh, what kind of marketing approach and framing would be best here. And then it's like, what is the, what is the, what is the environmental uh, scan look like in terms of the contents? What's the competition? Uh, there are other bee related films out there that we identified. Can we copy what they were doing a bit? Um, how do we distinguish uh, our film from those other films? And these are things, no matter what your film is, you need to be aware, how is it working? And um, this is where I suggest getting outside eyes on your, on your film, getting some objective, objective analysis around your film and, and, and figuring out how it works as an object in the world. Start to define it. Um, what are the sales and market prospects for this film? Be realistic. You need to focus limited amounts of resources here, right? Um, is it realistic to apply to the bigger festival? Should we be looking at um, uh, uh, other thematic festivals, if you're a human rights doc, a human rights film, identity festivals, if you're an LGBTQ plus film, should we be focusing on the queer festival circuit, et cetera? What, you know, what is this film? How is it working in the world? That has to happen before you submit to festivals because it has to define your plan. Here we uh, regrouped around some next steps and we identified a new fresh round of, uh, of, uh, of festivals that were probably more realistic for them in terms of regional and local type festivals. And they had success. They got in on circuit. They eventually bought their limited theatrical, uh, limited theatrical campaign working with uh, demand films in Canada and, and the film landed out in the world. Um, so that's where it starts, really breaking the film down figuring out the resources at hand, figuring out how the film's working and figuring out the business goals, marketing and sales goals around the film and how festivals can best, you know, what festivals can best leverage and enable those goals. Um, um, now I'm gonna move over to um, a, a tracking sheet. Just let me give me a second here to look at our, our questions and run through some. What defines if a documentary is Canadian or international? Well, that's simple. It's the financing. Um, um, uh, Canadian film is, is, is majority financed in Canada. If it's a co-production, it's majority or mi minority finance in Canada. Um, and, and if it's not majority or uh, minority finance in Canada, it's an international film. Um, if you're a Canadian filmmaker and you self-financed your film, it's a Canadian film. Um, the language does not make a difference. If you filmed in Spanish, you're a Canadian filmmaker and you filmed, um, uh, you filmed Canadian, uh, in short. I hope that answers your question. Um, well, I've answered Emily's question. Uh, are there small, are there small offenders worth the money? Uh, that's a great question. And I'm going to get to that when I run through some sample scenarios here. Again, it depends on the goals. Um, I think a critical mass of smaller festivals are better than one major festival, for instance. Um, it really depends on your film. You can be in the business of kind of laurel collecting. That's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, we're talking about a 5,000 plus film festival universe out, out there right now. Anyone that goes on Film Freeway can sort of see on any given week, there's 100 festivals with deadlines. And, um, and you got to decide what worth the money means to you. Um, and we'll, I'll drill down into that a bit, but uh, when, when I get into specific strategies. Um, my strategy is to apply to every festival that is supported by telephone, but don't get into any of these festivals. What can be done to support my project, seeing we spent thousands? Well, I try to focus attention in terms of submissions and say, okay, this is my window, three months. This is my budget, $2,000. If that doesn't work, What's my backup plan? Um, and, you're, and you're running parallel options there. You're submitting the festivals, but you're testing the market in other ways. You might be setting up other kinds of outreach screenings. You might be doing another strategy altogether. So festivals are a risk. I mean, the numbers are 
really eye-opening. Um, most of the major festivals, uh, let's say Toronto, Berlin, Sundance, Cannes, most of the major except, uh, festivals accept unsolicited submissions. They get thousands of them. Um, and for both feature, fiction features and documentaries and shorts, the acceptance rates are less than 2% um, by, my, by my math. Um, for an uns, totally unsolicited film going to a major festival, it's probably realistically more like 1%. This is a film that the festival knows nothing about or you're an unknown filmmaker. It's probably about 1%. Have a backup plan is, is, uh, is the news there. Have a strategy, one that, and kind of festival proof your film as well. Um, are, are some quick answers to that question. Um, uh, it is great. We're very lucky in Canada because I work with international filmmakers uh, and, and the Americans especially have no supports like we have uh, with telefilm or the Europeans have with their national agencies. They don't get the submission fees waived for Sundance in Berlin like we're fortunate enough to do here. Berlin, Sun Berlin, and Sundance submission fees are over $150. That adds up. So we're very fortunate to have, uh, to, so we can take those risks at Berlin without thinking too much about your budget. Um, the submissions late to a festival deadlines get the same chance. There's a bit of an art here. Um, I, I think the late submission deadlines are fine and real. Um, if your film is done, you have a done, done film, you hit the earlier deadlines, it won't hurt you. If you're not done though, make sure you're done and use that late deadline and lock up that film. Don't submit a rough cut ever. Don't even submit fine cuts, finish your film um, properly. It's so competitive you, and you always regret if you don't have a finished film and even if you're a locked picture, but maybe the sound's not all done, sometimes that's okay, but if the sound in your film is going to make a big difference, uh, get that finished. You're always going to regret if, if, if submitting a film too soon if you don't get in. You're going to think, oh, you know, maybe if we were done, we could have got in. You know, some festivals, you know, festivals will take resubmissions sometimes, but I don't think realistically they get a fair shot. So make sure you're ready when you go out. It's a big, as I've mentioned here, it's a big investment. Be ready. Be ready to go. Um, re, uh, advice around reaching out to programmers directly. Uh, um, sure, they get lots of emails. Sometimes it's better if you have like a, a very specific question. Um, keep that email super short. Uh, and uh, I don't know how helpful it is. There's this notion that, you know, you've got a lobby or, or there's advocacy happening with the programmers. I'll honestly say that, you know, I've, I've been a festival programmer. Um, uh, I've been in this world for a long time, working with festivals on both on all ends of the equations. They want good films. They, they want to, you know, they want to discover films. It's an overwhelming process, as I've said. When you're at when you're a programmer at TIFF and you've got two thousand submissions, you know, it's overwhelming. Of course, there's all the special specialists at each festival, the documentary folks, the folks who are programming by territory or by form, et cetera. But even then, they're, you know, even they're overwhelmed. The short film festivals, that, I think at Sundance there are like three short film festival programmers. They get 15,000, in excess of 15,000 short film festival, short films submitted to Sundance. Is it gonna matter if you write an email? I don't know. I mean, it's gotta, you gotta have a good question or a good reason, I think. Otherwise it's just another email in someone's inbox and who likes that? Um, do you think it's worth targeting festival specific to the themes? Absolutely. I'm going to run down the kind of pyramid I use in terms of how to sort of think through a strategy and how to consider all the various sort of uh, genre festivals, the identity festivals, et cetera. So I'll show you an example of that in a second. What are your thoughts about working with or without a distributor? Uh, with an independent? I think distributors for shorts are hard to get. Um, we have a couple short uh, film specialty distributors in Canada, H264 in Montreal, for instance, is, uh, does very well uh, with short films on the circuit. Um, but it's hard to get, uh, you know, it's kind of chicken or egg a little bit here, right? Um, you know, with a short film, the some of these distributors will want to see that you got into a few festivals before they jump on. Um, uh, in some instances with a short, 
that they think they can do festivals because they monetize festivals the distributors um, the short films they'll take it on because they think it can do festivals um, so a little bit of both i would say shop it around to the short specialty distributors but also start submitting to your festivals and i have a sample here of a short film festival tracking strategy um, i answered the contacting uh, programmers do programmers read cover letters no I mean, here's the deal. This is this is what you need. You need a good 50 to 75 minute synopsis. Uh, our Canadian friend and colleague, uh, Jan Wolfkamp, now based in, in Greece, sent me uh, a very good note he's written around the importance of your log line. Uh, write a good, clear synopsis. Uh, I, I say 50 to 75 words that really cues up the film, sets the frame in terms of what do I want in this programmer's and ahead before they press play on the Vimeo link. And the other thing is another 75 to 150 word kind of director statement. Why did you make this film? What's your intent here? What, what's the other piece of information this programmer has to have in their head before they press play that might be helpful in terms of cueing their attention? And, and those are really the two things that you need. A bunch of stills, even a trailer. I wouldn't put a lot of work into putting, putting together a trailer until until you got the festival figured out because you know trailers don't need to be done until you're marketing the film it's that simple a short tight synopsis and a short tight filmmaker statement that's what you need um cover letters that's basically your cover letter anyway um, and those things are always part of the submission form anyway so i don't you know who's reading cover letters? um the link for the report isn't working uh i've shared it so we'll, we'll get on that yeah I'll, I'll i'll get to canadian film festivals i have a good a good sample for that if you want to take a movie up for the bottom how do you do it without making the ones above it fall it's a green screen i've already said that okay i'm a queer filmmaker but i have a film isn't about queer identity yes um lgbtq festivals are uh, for queer makers and for queer content. Um, who's buying short films? Oh, I can't answer that here. Who's, uh, it's really tough out there. Um, you know, there are a lot of online platforms that are buying short films uh, is, all, is really, I mean, that's a whole other workshop is, is what I'll say. Um, I worked on a couple of short films that were bought by New Yorker Magazine, for instance, of Canadian films. Um, um, you know, so there's a market for short films. Top, being an alumni at a top uh, top tier film festival is certainly helpful. And that's when you write the programmer to remind them that you've been in that festival in the past. I do that all the time with the filmmakers I work with. Um, they like alumni, they like supporting alumni. And then any best practices? This is a great question to lead me into part two here. We're, we're 40 minutes in, I also need a drink. Any advice on best practices while researching festival submission landscape? Well, perfect question. So let me now get you to get on. I think you can see now this uh, sample festival tracking sheet. These are basically, you know, samples from films that I've been working on recently and what we're doing. And, and this is a tracking template I use. It's not, uh, you know, I'm not a spreadsheet genius. It's pretty simple here. What's the festival or category festivals in? Where is it? This is an important column here when you're doing a festival tracking sheet. It's your, it's the order of the festivals by opening date. You've got to always be thinking through the premiere status of your film. Uh, first of all, your, your domestic premiere. So Canada, obviously for Canadian filmmakers, you got to be thinking through and also your international premiere. And I'll drill down into that a bit more as we get into the sheet. Submission link. Most festivals have three or more deadlines. You do want to hit the early deadline if you're ready for those deadlines. I've talked about readiness already. You save a bit of money when you do that, right? And it doesn't hurt your film to be in early. So usually there's an early deadline, there's some kind of standard deadline, and there's the last deadline. Um, and the fees go up on the sliding schedule. Um, and then, you know, we just confirm what date we actually got it in. Uh, this this is not a full note sheet, but if you you know like the keeners that I work with fill in all the notification dates, a lot of festivals don't stick to that. And here's the dreaded status column: what's happening out there? 
So this is a film for a film that was uh, ready to go out in the fall. Um, it was a featured documentary. It um, was also uh, largely animated. It also uh, deals with human rights. Those are the, the things you need to know. Um, I also believe and still believe it has a realistic chance to get into a kind of a le a level festival, despite our lack of luck on, with the fall season. And that's another thing you should know in these times. It's harder than ever. I mentioned these these stats: one percent, two percent. You know, all the festivals have uh, fewer slots now. TIFF it was almost half the size it's typically been. I don't think they'll ever go back up to a, a 250 plus feature film festival. I think they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll just be smaller from here on in. Um, um, still, we took the top down strategy. These three festivals here were kind of our sweet spot. Fortunately, you know, uh, um, unfortunately, we didn't get to any. Fortunately, I, I believe Telefilm, we got a fee waiver with Venice, so we might have saved a few bucks there. And we, we submitted to both Venice and the Critics Weeks there because they tend to take some documentaries in the Critics Week. Um, we are also kind of keeping an eye on the Canadian circuit here. And that's, these are these festivals here. We wouldn't have gone to any of these festivals unless we got into TIFF. We just weren't ready to blow our world premiere. Not saying that these aren't all wonderful festivals in their own right. We just wanted to keep our premiere options open. This was an Asian, uh, the, whoops, the film and the content in this film was uh, uh, largely around uh, human rights issues in China. We wanted to keep the world premiere open for Busan, for instance. Um, we did so while we were keeping an eye on the deadlines, ultimately we decided not to submit to the Canadian circuit because um, we didn't get into TIFF. And, and uh, if we had gotten into TIFF, we would have heard probably in July or August, and I might have scrambled and asked these festivals if they would accept a late submission, given that we were premiering at TIFF and they probably would have given it to us. But in this case, we did not even submit to the festivals. We did submit to VIF, however, because we would have might have considered uh, premiering at VIF. It does have some international uh, reach and uh, is particularly uh, good, I think, for for Asian content, and so uh, we did keep that card open, but we didn't get in anyway. We might not have played though, uh, to be honest. If we gotten in, we would have had to have a hard think about that. So our next premier sweet spot became we didn't get there, we didn't work out there. Became kind of IDFA. It's a documentary, right? We had Busan and IDFA kind of targeted, uh, both of which did not pan out, but we we still weren't ready to sort of give up on the kind of A-list festival dream. Uh, so our next window became Sundance in Berlin with a Rotterdam fallback. Now, Sundance hasn't worked out because uh, they're done. I mean, they haven't announced yet that they're done. We didn't hear from them yet that they're done. So I don't think that's going to work out. You know, so we're waiting now on Berlin, really. But what we've done after Berlin here in this example is start to open it up, right? Start to look at our kind of the B circuit, the, the C circuit, test the market more. You know, still our hope though would be South by Southwest. And if it doesn't work out for Berlin, uh, then our next premier hope hope is South by a configuration of South by Southwest and Copenhagen, both of which I think we have a real shot at again. So we're, we're really being patient here. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, we will land somewhere here, like in this kind of window here, the smaller documentary festivals, the human rights festivals, and, and then we start uh, laying in the animation festivals here too, um, and, and really start to open it up. And that's the strategy. It's a waiting game. There is a significant investment here in terms of festival submissions, fortunately subsidized a little bit by some free submissions via, via telefilms offerings. Um, it's researching films that are appropriate for this film. It's looking at all the categories. Um, this film has a VR component, so we're, we're keeping that in mind, especially with South by Southwest, because they're also, you know, they want VR, they want VR pieces as part of it. And it was patient. It was patience here. It was like, we have a plan. It's harder to take the, it's harder, to, it's easier to take, sorry. It's easier to take the rejection when you have a plan. Okay, next. We know what the long game here is. We will land in festivals. They are part of the strategy. There is a backup plan here though. Um, um, and, and, and we're also starting to sort of test the distribution waters, et cetera, um, for this film.
but that is the plan. And so the categories become important too, right? Our, our first plan is that we wanted to be at a major international festivals, but the documentary festivals are still in play here. Then we've got, um, then we start looking later down the road at the human rights festivals, the animation festivals, um, et cetera, right? And you see later down the road where it's, lot, it's international festival heavy up top, we start to spread our wings a bit here and get into the, the other sort of category, festival categories, animation, human rights, and documentary for this particular film. Um, and that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of like the top down approach. Now here, just in terms of researching, well, okay, Sean, you know all these festivals, et cetera. How, you know, I knew this, how do I figure out these festivals? Well, I'll show you what I do. This is an animated, you know, really, I mean, this is an, an animated documentary, right? Largely animated documentaries. But what other animated documentaries are out there this year and what are they doing? Well, one of the biggest uh, documentaries and a film that's probably going to get an Oscar nomination for sure, and maybe the Oscar, is a documentary called Flea. Um, best case scenario here, but uh, let's, what, let's, what do they do? Simple has, I, you know, I always recommend if you're a professional, get the IMDB Pro account. It's awesome for research. I keep a lot of lists and do a lot of different kinds of research here. This is my 2021 documentary list. Um, Flea is an animated documentary. I'm working on an animated documentary. What do they do? In the details section on IMDB, I see you're all seeing this. I can't quite tell what you're seeing. If you're not, let me know. Um, boom, here's a festival. Here's what they did. Uh, they released at Sundance. Interestingly, um, so they released at Sundance, the best place to release a feature documentary for if you're American. Uh, in this case, it's a Danish production, but the best place to release a feature documentary, uh, bar none. Um, they released in January, but they clearly, even in January, they had Oscar on their mind because they didn't do anything again until the fall to start an Oscar campaign. And then they saturated the festivals. They just saturated uh, ever since the fall. They've been playing all the festivals. So right away, they're like, well, these festivals are good enough to flee. They're good enough for us. And so these become part of you know, our, our kind of tracking list. And you can see they just played everything internationally. Same thing. They started big, but then they started spreading their wings and uh, doing a lot of festivals. And here you get a good sense of kind of a way to have it's like a recommendation engine, right? Like if, if a film like this is playing all these festivals, that's where you wanna be, right? What are, what are the films like mine that are out there? What, what festivals are playing the, the top top films? And this film has had God, at least 50 to 60 international film festivals uh, through running, you know, through till now and into the new year. They're doing an Oscar run. Um, they want to be out there. They want to be in the conversation. Um, and you could do that. Um, see here. Yeah. Anyway, this is, a, yeah, these are some docs I have on a 2020 list. And I can go to any of these films. This is kind of ordered by the movie meter. So I got the biggest one. What did Jagged do? Um, you know, uh, you can look at Canadian films, et cetera. Jagged premiere at TIFF out a more kind of judicious, uh, more kind of streamlined circuit because they went TIFF, they were ready to do their, their VOD launch, right? In the fall, which is on VOD now. Um, and they did TIFF just for some marketing. They did Doc NYC to do some, you know, New York and, and uh, to, to TIFF publicity, boom, they're out. They didn't do a lot of festivals. Also a good strategy. Um, so uh, IMDB Pro is a great research engine find the you know a lot of the once you sort of say okay these are the other films like mine that are out there go to their websites look at their screening list you know uh imitation is flattery um we don't have to reinvent the wheel here there's um a lot of best practices already out there on the, the the important thing is understanding how your film is working just to circle back to that um, now, I, this is an example of a top-down strategy that applies for a major feature uh, documentary, a major feature film targeting the big festivals, and then, uh, you know, uh, pyramiding down, or I guess pyramiding up to the, uh, casting a wider net in terms of all the category festivals and the smaller festivals in the entire circuit. 
I'm going to give you a, a slightly different example here. This is um, uh, this is a strategy here again, a film that was ready to go out in the fall. So same timeline as a, an example that I used uh, last time. Also a feature uh, documentary. Um, it, it, um, it, uh, the subject matter is LGBTQ plus. Um, so we're going to be looking at the queer circuit and the identity cat. Another identity category here is um, um, the characters in the film were all South Asian. Um, so, uh, and uh, also of importance here, it's an impact film. This is a film that was made to change hearts and minds. It's an impact like strategy. Um, not only was it ready to premiere at festivals uh, in the fall, everything else on the film was also ready to go. All the marketing materials, all the sales and distribution structure around the film. I'm still working out, still working out a few things on that. Um, the, most importantly for this film, the educational strategy and rights were in place, uh, uh, a non-exclusive uh, agreement with an educational distributor, plus the producer held educational rights, meaning as we we're going to these festivals, he could be doing in-school uh, in screenings, virtual screenings, and, we're, and monetizing all the educational sales in tandem with the film festival, uh, uh, film festival um, distribution campaign. Um, we identified Outfest in Los Angeles as uh, one of the top 10 uh, LGBTQ plus festivals uh, to premiere at. We threw our hat into the ring at TIFF. Uh, I, I didn't see a high likelihood here, but why not try? Um, but we weren't going to get too precious about the premiere here. We were ready to go. The first uh, invitation uh, we got was for Palm Springs um mid-september and we said yes it's a small festival um but it didn't matter we want we were ready to go this was all about saturation and accumulation of festivals so at any given time right now this film is playing at a film festival um you know premiered mid-september the week after it was in atlanta chicago and philadelphia um mostly online unfortunately um uh, a week after that, it was having uh, it was it was in Seattle. A week after that, it was in four film festivals uh, in in the U.S. and Canada. The next week, we had uh, our Toronto premiere at Real World, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the sweet spot here is the is the queer circuit, the South Asian circuit, the documentaries documentary festivals. Uh, 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 festivals around diversity, um, and, and that's what we've been hitting hard. And we're at a festival every week. Uh, we had a joint premiere in Montreal in the late November at the at Image Plus Nation and uh, South Asian Film Festival at Montreal. I had to sort of negotiate a little joint premiere situation there where everyone could share the film a little bit there in Montreal, which worked out well. We had both a live event screening there with the closing night film at the South Asian Festival, and we were available um, through Image uh, Plus Nation's uh, virtual uh, virtual screening uh, platform. Uh, the next big thing was, of course, our premiere in India, which just happened last weekend at the uh, Queer Film Festival in Chennai, um, and they did a live Q and A after the film. So we've got these other Indian festivals that um, it doesn't look like we're having much luck. We got. Our second Indian festival, uh, in festival in India, is uh, coming up in January, and we've got some other good prospects. Um, and then we're just doing the circuit, and now we're waiting on. Look at this, we're waiting on festivals through. So we've got festival submissions out there right now through next summer. Um, we've got well over 150 festival submissions on this. This is uh, represents an investment of about eight nine thousand dollars on the part of the the producers, um, the festival saturation was a big part of their impact and outreach campaign. There's a whole bunch of media and social media assets being generated by being at a lot of festivals. Um, it's a lot to keep track of, a lot to service, but we obviously have a ton of laurels and we're starting to get a couple of awards. All that helps drive the marketing and awareness around the film. We're starting to think about international sales more um, as we finish up our few broadcast sales here in Canada. 
and this was this is the saturation approach. If you have a film that can play a number of categories of festivals, this is a good approach. Um, and and, uh, and it's totally worked here, and, and it's been very rewarding to work on. And we've been playing at festivals around the world. And uh, finally, because we're going to, you know, I've been talking here an hour, we're going to get it. I want to open up to more questions, and uh, as well, I'll give a final example. Of a, of a short film uh, that we're just getting out into the world. Um, also, uh, um, uh, queer non-binary subject matter, uh, a short that I think has a chance with the major festivals, and it's a documentary. So um, uh, Clermont Ferrand is the biggest festival for short films. We haven't heard from them yet, which does not bode well, but uh, still possible. We haven't heard not yet. Uh, Berlin is uh, a great place to premiere a queer themed film. Uh, the Teddy Award just is like a magnet for other uh, uh, queer film festivals. And if you're in that uh, competition, the Teddy competition in Berlin, um, you're going to get a lot of requests to submit your film elsewhere. And that's a, a good thing to mention too. You know, the advantages of being, of taking this top down approach and waiting for a, a, fest, a major festival or, or trying for major festivals is that it's going to really help amplify your film with other festivals. What's the easiest way to get into a bunch of film festivals? Get into a big one. Um, we're talking about, uh, you know, these, you know, TIFF, Sundance, Berlin, all these bigger festivals. Um, you know, the bigger uh, queer festivals, the bigger Asian festivals, the bigger human rights festivals. That's where other program, festival programmers look for content. Um, they're shopping at the big festivals. So um, this is why we make the investment and try to get into a big festivals. It saves time and money down the road in terms of, um, in terms of uh, creating a situation where other festivals are soliciting, uh, soliciting submissions for your uh, film. Uh, based on a premiere at a larger festival. So back to the short example, uh, we're trying uh, a cross section of documentary shorts uh, and international festivals here. We've been very selective about the uh, about our premiere window here. We're not sort of submitting to too many festivals. We're, we're being mindful of the budget uh, at first. These are all places where uh, we would feel comfortable premiering a film if they come through. Uh, and uh, but near the end, of course, we start to open it up to the queer circuit, et cetera. So hopefully within this window, we, land, we find our world premiere. And once that's settled, we'll figure out our strategy moving forward, which would be to open up. We'll submit to some other festivals, but based on an invitation to one of these festivals, we'll also request a fee waivers. We'll also see if we can get other festivals interested in the film as a kind of um, um, solicited uh, submission. And I'm going to pause to drink right now um, and take a look at your questions. But again, I'm really, oh, there are more questions here, so go through there. I'm super open at this point. We've got about another little, uh, half hour to go. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We've got another half hour to go here. I'm super open to very specific kind of like uh, questions. If you want to workshop some ideas, a little hard to do, I know, on, on text here, but I'll do my best to sort of answer some specific questions. But let me just take a drink and then look at these questions. See, it's a green screen. Look, it goes away. It's a little visual trick. Um, all right. So let me pull this up. So I'm not looking too much at the side now here. Um, best practices while researching fest festivals. I said that. Look at what other films like your films are doing and copy it. Um, I retain the rights to my award featured by Hair Canada. Any suggestions on how to approach the marketplace here? Well, if your first, first and second broadcast rights are sold in Canada, that's your market. That's all you can sell. I mean, they, they, they want the VOD too now, right? So, I mean, the, the thing with documentaries is I say always try to hang on to the educational rights. That can be worth it and sort of long tail. And so broadcasters will do non-exclusive educational rights like CBC and TV and knowledge. They also have educational markets to exploit, but you can hold uh, those deals should be and are usually non-exclusive. So you can sort of 
support the educational market for a featured documentary. You can do community screenings, et cetera. But um, a theatrical distributor, for instance, wouldn't be interested because the, you know, the broadcast sale is the best sale. So and we've already done that. How much is a late submission to have answered that? Premier status for short films does not matter as much for, as for features. It's a little bit more open for, for shorts. Still, um, I think this answers another question. Prioritize. It's just in your best interest to prioritize a bit. Spend the you know, first couple or so months of that window, just hit the big ones. Open it up after that. But it doesn't matter as much uh, for short films. You know, festivals like TIFF, Berlin, et cetera, the usual uh, suspects would prefer world premieres. Um, you know, um, that's all. Um, uh, and it is a good idea to short to look at the Oscar qualifying uh, list. Uh, if you go to the Academy uh, website, you can find the list of sh um, qualifying festivals for short films. That's a good way to sort of narrow your attention in terms of what festivals you should submit your, your short to. Um, you know, uh, the qualifier with that list is that you know, you qualify for the Oscar nomination if you win an award at most of these festivals, not just being selected isn't enough. But look at that list um, because, you know, the Academy has vetted those festivals and it's a good list. I look at that short film uh, qualifying list to help guide uh, me when I'm uh, working on a short film. Um, does a Canadian, uh, as a Canadian film, does it do more for the exposures of the film that premiere at Trebek or TIFF? Uh, Good question. I, I would say, um, generally speaking here, uh, more than like Tribeca or TIFF, it's like, when it, it, is it better for you to launch your film in the spring or the fall? So, that, you know, it's seasonal a little bit. I mean, some people feel that, you know, at TIFF, if you're a Canadian film, maybe you're sort of like, you know, not, you know, didn't get the same attention as some other films. I don't necessarily think that holds true. Um, I still think TIFF is, is the best place to premiere a Canadian feature film um, because you have that circuit of uh, festivals in Canada immediately following, you know, Sudbury, uh, Fin Atlantic, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Windsor, London, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it falls a really nice time to, to hit a number of festivals in Canada and have fallbacks to TIFF as well. And if you do premiere, say, say you didn't get into TIFF and you select Vancouver or Edmonton, if you're an Edmonton filmmaker, it's always great to premiere in your hometown. You've only blown your Canadian premiere and your international premiere is still open. So for example, you know, you're still kind of in play for Sundance in Berlin if your international premiere is open, because um, um, that's fine for them. Um, however, if you premiere at Tribeca, um, you know, TIFF uh, might not like that you don't, they don't have the world premiere of a Canadian film. So it might kind of work against you. Um, you know, TIFF typically, if a Canadian film premieres at Cannes, there's a pretty good shot of doing TIFF. It would be a little embarrassing maybe if they didn't. Most of the time films that, Canadian films that premiere at Cannes tend to circle back and do TIFF. Maybe not Tribeca, maybe not South By. That might be a little bit more of a hurdle. For you to get over. Um, so it's a risk um, for sure if you want to do both the premiere at uh, one of the spring US festivals, for instance. Um, you know, uh, you know, so you know, there are some, especially some of the real formalist work, experimental work that might premiere at Berlin or Locarno. TIFF might pick that work up. Um, that's not a bad strategy for uh, for Canadian film sometimes. You see that happening. Um, but it's it's a gamble. Um, all these big festivals uh, much prefer world premieres. Um, we've answered the uh, uh, question around submitting a bit later to festivals. Don't worry about submitting too late for festivals. You submit the festivals when the film is ready and when you're ready to go out with the film. Um, the last deadline's fine. It's fine. Sometimes festivals will extend a, a deadline for a week or two. That's fine too. Um, again, part of that is based on the film, you know, and your assessment of 
of is this the right festival for this film? Does it really, you know, is it in the ballpark? You know, does it have a chance? That's a part of, you know, like I, I won't submit a kind of film that I don't think is going to work for TIFF. I'm not going to submit it two weeks past the deadline. I mean, there's two things. I'm asking them for a deadline extension here. It better be worth their time. It better be in the ballpark. That's part of the uh, kind of assessment. After we premiered at a quality regional festival and a Canadian festival, example, VIF, is there something we should be doing to leverage that success for future film festivals? Um, you know, uh, festivals like, you know, festivals like other, you know, to know about other festivals. So like you start, you know, you might say, you know, um, start asking for like fee waivers and, and, and other things. You know, uh, that, that's about it. Um, uh, there's not much you can do after that. Uh, you know, what I say is how long do you want to be doing this? So I always have like, I always sort of uh, instill the discipline of a kind of festival window. You know, windowing is a big part of this. Um, you know, like I say, hey, you know, like, even though I've showed you an example here where we're going to be doing festivals, it looks like for a year to 18 months, like really like six months like what's the plan here right what are you using festivals for how long do you want to sort of you know uh uh you know like work on this for so like i say give yourself six months you should have a landing spot here right you're doing festivals because you're going to be on vod at this date and you're using festivals to build up your marketing assets so you should be windowing and everything should be leading into it each other you're not just doing sort of the sort of open window of festivals, right? At some point, the film's got to be also commercially available. So you're going to have a festival's window and that's going to try to get free submissions with Telefilm. Well, Telefilm, uh, sign up for the newsletter. Uh, they do offer consolidated submissions to a select number of festivals and they do send uh, pretty regular emails around in terms of uh, submission deadlines for other festivals. But do your research, like even that festival email, they tend to be all very good, incredible festivals, but um, they might not be appropriate for your film. Gothenburg might not be a good, uh, you know, the place that is realistic to think about premiering a film. They don't really premiere a lot of films there, unless they're Nordic films. Um, it's a good place to play if you've been at other festivals as a Canadian film. So get on to the Telefilm Festival's email list is, uh, and keep an eye on, on the supports that they're offering and to the deadlines that they're putting out. They're all good festivals. Uh, South by Southwest has done some early rejections. It's true. Uh, their picture clarifies a lot after the Sundance announcement, which is imminent. Um, um, it's good news if you haven't been declined already. Um, but really, they don't get really, they're not really done at South by until late January, early February. So, um, and you probably don't get your, they probably don't do their final round of rejections at South by until like early February. Usually it's just before they announce, right? Because they want to lock up their festival airtight before they start declining films. So, um, um, yeah, good that you haven't been rejected yet already. So. Uh, Okay, virtual festivals, hybrid models, sales uh, distribute. Yeah, all sales and dist these distributors aren't going to as many festivals. How are buyers screening films? So, yeah, good question. It's really tough in the sales and distribution world right now. Most of the sales agents uh, and the distributors are sitting on, on a backlog of titles. They're not committing to too much anymore. They're kind of in a deep hold. If, the, if they're sort of, I'm working on a couple films where like some major sales agents are, are kind of doing a dance with the producers. Yeah, we're interested. Let us know if you get into Sundance or Berlin and maybe we'll talk. They don't want to commit to films unless they're in a market because why? They, they don't have anywhere to sell them. It's, it's they're very difficult times to get um, the attention of a international sales agent or distributor um, right now. For sure, they're being very selective. Your film's got to really be a very obvious market commodity um, to do so, is, is all I can say about that. Um, and yes, a major festival invitation certainly does a lot to stimulate uh, distributor and sales agent interest. That's why you invest in submitting to the major festivals. Um, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee sales. <laughs> 
you know, not all the films that go to Sundance of Berlin get sold. Still a lot of work. I've answered the short Oscar qualifier question. Uh, yes, start with that list. Screening fees from festivals, great question. Um, yes, um, you know, there are several questions you should ask when you're invited to a film festival, not necessarily the major festivals, because they're not paying screening fees. Um, and you're not going to even ask them for that. Um, um, you know, they will subsidize some travel, etc. But they're not, they're just not paying screening fees. Um, however, all the other festivals do pay screening fees. They have to these days. Um, distributors demand it of them. Um, so uh, one of the questions to ask if you get into one of those festivals is, do you pay screening fees? Ask the question. Um, more than half of them will say, well, yeah, how much were you thinking about? The typical ranges are 250 to 750. If they want to screen your film on their virtual platform, uh, they want to stream the film, ask them about their geoblocking policies. Do they geoblock to the city, the province, the state, the country? Um, how long is it available? Do they offer you a revenue share or a flat fee? Those things should always be offered from these festivals for uh, the, when they're streaming. Film festivals that are doing online VOD screenings, that's your premium VOD window. They're charging 10 to $15 per view. You need to get 35 to 40% of that revenue pie or a decent flat fee. There should be a limited uh, limits in terms of uh, uh, deal blocking. There should be limits in terms of the number of streams allowed, 300, 400, 500, and there should be a revenue share. Most festivals are offering that, but you have to ask. Um, other questions ask uh, of film festivals. Uh, what are, is there gonna be a, a live or virtual Q and A? Do you, if you're having a live event, are you having a live event? If so, is my film gonna be screened uh, at the live event or just online? Some festivals are doing these hybrid events and they say you're invited to the festival only to find out you know, they're screening 15 films live and 25, 40 films on hybrid. You want to know that information it might impact your decision to accept that invitation or not. Ask these questions. Um, is there, if it's a virtual screening, will there be a Q&A? Uh, or, a, you know, what's the situation? Ask these questions before accepting. You want to know what you're getting yourself into. This is a business negotiation. You can't ask questions. Just, you shouldn't be surprised or disappointed. Is my film eligible for an award? Is it in the competition? These are other questions to ask when you're invited. After you're invited, it's kind of too late. Um, it might inform your decision whether you're going to do the festival or not. Like I said, this is a distribution and exhibition circuit. Festivals are charging fees. Um, they sh um, credible festivals should, and most of them, and many of them are, paying uh, paying fees or doing revenue sharing, uh, but you have to ask. Um, official website, should it be launched? Uh, when should I do my website, et cetera? You, know, you don't have to sort of have some fancy website. Certainly when you premiere the film at a festival, there should be some place um, people can find you online. It could be simple as a landing page, kind of like website with maybe an email sign up. It could be a Facebook page. This is one of the things that I, I, more and more, you know, the value of doing festivals, right? I showed you that kind of saturation approach, the so-called impact approach where we're doing all these film festivals. Well, what we're trying to do with every one of those film festivals is build our social media followings. So another thing I ask film festivals for is, hey, can you include a link to our Facebook or Insta page or our website on the film description on your website so people can find us and follow us? Um, um, you know, if you are doing a Q&A, can we put, you know, can we sort of like get a sense? If you are doing, sorry, if you are doing a VOD, can you give us a sense of how many people streamed the film, where they were, can you give us some data on that? Do you want to sort of use festivals to understand the market for a film? Um, so yeah, um, have some place, when you're at a festival, you should have at least some place people can find you online and, and uh, you want, should have some of your social media tags ready so that you can start tracking any kind of virtual chatter that's happening around your film. Um, and, and that infrastructure should be in place, but you don't have to do some sort of deluxe fancy website. Just super simple, right? 
um, and, and maybe figure out the social media channels that would work best for your film. You know, Facebook and Insta are the two standards, but more and more, uh, certainly we're doing TikTok uh, as well um, and, and sort of having the assets ready, which is another reason that you got to be ready, right? Part of being ready for film festivals mean all your social media assets are ready too. So if you're going to be doing some content marketing, that stuff's ready to go. That takes time. Um, yeah, the question again, just to reiterate when, uh, the, you know, um, it is like picture lock. Don't, don't spend anything less than a picture lock. Sure, the color doesn't have to be done. Sure, all the sound doesn't have to be done. The picture has got to be locked. Um, is there a way to make back your investment in festivals besides sales? Uh, I don't know what make, make back your investment. They, there is no, you're not gonna, in terms of like whatever financial investment in your film is, the, the, the hard honest truth is that you, you never make back your financial investment. They're just like very few films recoup. Um, that's, you know, which is the beauty of a system where most of our films are publicly financed. Um, and if you went into a producer deficit, um, you know, you'd be very lucky to recoup that. You know, it's just like what I try to do with festivals and theatrical, any kind of events is for them to be self-financed. Sure, there's some revenues out there. Um, there is some, you know, fundraising around those through public funding, either nationally or provincially, Telefilm has some marketing funds. Um, your provincial agencies have um, some marketing funds, but you have to create a budget and you have to realize there is no pot of gold out there for an independent feature film. It's just not there. There isn't, uh, the TVOD revenue isn't there. It's a very long tail. Um, Netflix isn't acquiring films, they're free financing. If you're going into the market with uh, all rights available on a feature length film, unless you're in the top 1%, you're just not going to recoup um, any personal finances. It's just uh, you invest in festivals, you invest in distribution because you want your film to be discovered and seen so you can make another one. Uh, um, um, and you try not to lose money on festivals and you try not to lose money on theatrical distribution. That's the model, um, at least the way I work and from everything I've seen. Um, sure, if you have a very market friendly, uh, you know, easy to come out of five feature film or documentary, a sales agent is going to come on board and over time they're going to recoup uh, or do their best because that's their business. But very few films get that kind of traditional distribution, uh, including documentaries. Can you list the top 10 film festivals? Sure. Uh, let me do my best. There's really five um, uh, in terms of uh, five festivals that stand apart from the pack. Uh, they are um, in calendar order, Sundance, Berlin, uh, Venice, TIFF, and, oh, sorry, Miss Can. whoops. Sundance, Berlin, Can, Venice, and TIFF. Those are the top five. Below that top five, there's another 10 or so international film festivals that are um, in that second tier, let's say. They're, and I'm just gonna go top ahead here. They are festivals like Rotterdam, Tribeca, South by Southwest, Acarno, uh, Busan, um, maybe San Sebastian, you get the point. The, the VIF maybe, um, those are the second tier-ish festivals. Um, if you have a documentary, your second tier would be IDFA in Amsterdam, Hot Docs, CPH Docs in Copenhagen. Um, let's say those three, maybe Visions Through Reality put in that league as well. That's in the L, Switzerland. If your short film, it's going to be Claremont Ferrand in that second top of that second tier. It's going to be Aspen um, there, some others. If you're an animated film, it's going to be Yamagata. Uh, Ottawa's good to premiere an animated film, etc. cetera. Uh, if you're a human rights film, it's going to be the Human Rights Watch Network or uh, One World in Prague. If you're an LGBTQ plus film, it's going to be New Fest in New York. It's going to be BFI Flair, Outfest, there's what five there. You get the picture here. And there's the top international, the second tier of international, then become all the local and regional festivals. That's where you get your Cinefests and your Edmontons and your Fin Atlantics and your Nashvilles and your blah, 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 Unix, you know. 
uh, and the same goes for the um, genre festivals. So there's a whole very great horror fantasy uh, festival circuit, Fantasia in Montreal being near the top of that list in that thing. There's the queer circuit, I've said those ones, human rights circuit, then there's the identity circuit, uh, LGBTQ+, Jewish uh, festival circuit, um, the Asian festivals, the South Asian festivals, et cetera, et cetera. So, you, you know, it's the pyramid, you break it down. Um, and it's not, you know, the international festivals, given a 1% or 2% sort of acceptance rate, not always the best place to start, right? If it, maybe it's better to start at a, if you're a documentary premiering at a major documentary festival, or, it, you know, one of the identity festivals. Um, uh, so um, that's it. How much a selling point is it for programmers if you can attend, and just getting back to the questions, if you can attend in person? Um, well, I mean, it's great. I mean, obviously, in-person events are a little tenuous these days. Um, not too many festivals cover too many of your expenses, so you got to be able to afford to do that. I wouldn't say it's a selling point. Um, it's a bonus. It's not a question they ask. Um, especially these days. Um, so it's not something you, uh, necessarily enhances a pitch. But anyway, you know, you don't really pitch the festival so anyway. Um, who sends in the festival submissions is the producer or the distributor? Uh, typically it's the producer, even if your film has distribution. Distributors, you know, they don't want to pay the fees. They're not only interested really in the top festivals. They want, you know, they don't want to do that work. So typically they'll sort of delegate that to the producer, um, but they might have, they might say, well, listen, something you obviously, if you have a distributor, obviously you've got to be communicating the strategy with them and they're going to have thoughts and opinions, um, but they'll probably be very happy for you to do that work and to pay those fees. Um, can you describe revenue sharing with filmmakers and VOD sales from online festivals? Yeah, sure. Typically the, in terms of the revenue share, it's somewhere between 35 and 50%. Some festivals are doing a kind of minimum guarantee against a percentage. So 300 minimum guarantee plus 35% for anything that, you know, if we exceed any sales that exceed that minimum guarantee. Some are doing just a straight $500. Rock Ontario, 500 views kind of flat deals. So there's a few different ways of slicing that up. But most of them are realizing they have to offer some kind of revenue share if they're doing a VOD option, and you should ask. Um, they're not offering that so much for the short film, so I'm, I'm sorry to say. Premiering at one fest can uh, screen another. How do you navigate the premiere strategy? I think I've kind of gone through that. Uh, in terms of thinking through premieres, you make an honest assessment with your film about its, its possibilities. If you think it has a shot at the top tier festivals, you try that top tier approach. So the bigger festivals I've mentioned, uh, top tier in your top tier international international first, then top tier by category. So if you're a documentary or et cetera, as I've sort of outlined here, you use that strategy through what I call the premiere window. That's the first three months of your festival submissions window, and then you open it up after that. Um, I'm a writer director. Uh, is it a good strategy to get your script into festivals? Uh, no. I mean, uh, you know, there's all these sort of online script festivals now. It's pretty scammy out there. I have a blog uh, that I've written about this recently on. I can put my link to that if nobody minds. Um, Here's some, here's a big caution out there for you, for those of you that are kind of film freeway shopping. Um, there's a lot of scamming going on, unfortunately, on, on out there, uh, especially on the film freeway platform. If you want to share that link, I've written about that here. Um, the script and the so-called screenplay feedback competitions are one of those. They're super dubious. I just don't think that's a place to go. I wouldn't spend a lot of money on getting script feedback from there, personally. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with the screenplay kind of festival market, but no, some, you know, some, the best way to sort of develop, you know, 
use the festivals in terms of a development window is to look at the major festivals and their lab programs. Berlin has a very good talent lab. TIFF has a talent lab. Uh, a lot of the festivals have labs. So just like submitting your, your finished film when you wanna look at credible festivals, when you're looking in terms of shopping a script around, it's better to put your effort into credible events with a reputation and to look at these, these sort of online uh, the competitions and feedback things. I just think that's a dubious world. And most of them are just all about getting the submissions revenue, which is kind of sucks. Um, the concierge service. I am, am I honest with filmmakers? I am absolutely honest as much as I can be. Like I, there's an art to giving feedback. I try to do no harm. Uh, and, and, but I really, you know, like if I'm gonna, if, when I work as a consultant on the film, you're not paying me to kind of wax your car. You want an honest assessment. And uh, sometimes those are hard conversations, but um, this is what I do as a consultant. I uh, try to really, and it's just not about saying, forget it, you're not gonna get into any festivals. It's like, what is this film and what can we do with it? That's what that's about. It's not about like bursting any bubbles. And so I really think a lot about how I offer feedback and especially at the delicate stage of fine cut, et cetera, because you know you haven't there haven't been many external inputs yet. And um, yeah, anyone that you consult with on your film should be honest with you. And that's why you sort of uh, get opinions outside of friends and family because you know they have a harder time doing that for obvious reasons. They got to live with you. Uh, festivals for doc on the arts. Yes, uh, there's a very good festival in Montreal for films. Uh, documentaries uh, about uh, about the arts, uh, for one, um, but top of mind, I, I can't think of any. Most festivals like films on, on the arts. There isn't a large circuit of uh, festivals that just deal with the arts, but the one in Montreal is worth checking out. And, um, and uh, as well, um, you know, of course there are, uh, I know there are music film festivals, there are architecture festivals, so with any category of the arts, for instance, you can find festivals. Um, uh, VR uh, distribution of movies with VR content, it's not an area of specialty. A lot of the festivals now, because they're getting funding and, you know, the market wants VR contact or have, you know, TIFF had some VR stuff going on, documentary festivals. We're all doing kind of VR content now. Um, South by Southwest, obviously, because it's also an interactive festival, is very interested in VR content, but it's not an area of, of expertise in, for me. When I do have a film that has uh, a sort of VR component into it, because in Canada, you know, you can get kind of funding for these other components, I, I do mention that. That's a good way to sort of poke a a festival programmer. By the way, this film also has a VR component, which might be of interest to you. How can you tell if a film festival is a scam on Film Freeway? That's easy. Go to the festival website, you know, look at past programs. Don't submit to festivals that are like one or two years old. You want a festival to have a, chat, a track record. Look at their sponsor list. Do they seem to have credible sponsors? Have they played real films in the past? Do they have a real live physical venue? Do they have, um, you know, normal deadlines, like one or two or three deadlines? A lot of the scam festivals have these sort of monthly rolling deadlines. That's a big red flag for me. They're just harvesting submission fees. But yeah, look at the websites. Like I say, I, I you know, just do some sort of Googling, look at past programs um, and, uh, and don't sort of do too many of the newer festivals. Fortunately, Film Freeway has a problem uh, there with uh, a lot of scam events. And, and uh, I've written about that on that blog that I sent around. Um, tips on navigating solicitations and festivals. Okay, here's a good one. Here's what happens a lot if you get invited to a, a major festival or even really any festival. You start getting like, I know we've got to start wrapping up here, so I'm going to move fast. You start getting solicitations like, hey, submit to our festival. Here's a 25% discount. No, I mean, a, a credible festival solicitation is a full discount, wa is a full waiver on the fee, first of all. So, you, you know, like, we'll be glad to submit with a full waiver. Also, again, check out the festival website. Does it check out? Are they credible? Have they had past editions? All the things I just mentioned here. But don't 
fall for those. It's like almost like a phishing scheme. Don't fall for those. We'll give you a 25% discount. If, they're, if they want to submit and they're interested in your film because they saw it in another festival and they want to consider it, they'll, they, a credible festival will offer you a full discount. Um, yeah, just in terms of if you don't get into the big festivals with your short film, the adjustment strategy is try smaller festivals. <laughs> but again, have the discipline of setting a budget and sticking with it and setting yourself a window. Uh, oh, Sundance sent all the rejections on the 6th, apparently. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. I pretty much assume. I know most, I'm dealing with about a few films that were sent, sent there. And, I, and we'd gotten some personal letters. And, and uh, so I guess the form letters went out as well. Sorry to those of you who got those. And I know that one of the advantages of submitting through Telefilm is you also get an early notice whether like it didn't work for them or they brought you through to the sort of next round. That's useful too. The earlier you can find out what's going on in terms of major festival decisions, the easier, uh, the easier to um, the easier to figure out your strategy. I'm happy to share my template. It's not exactly a work of genius. Here, I'll just put them. I'll just put the um, the share. I'll put a share document in there. With it. The deal is though, if you make it better, you got to send me it. So I'm going to put a link here, and I think you could just download that if uh, if Telefilm shares this link with you. It's just a Google document, I made. Mean, it's nothing fancy. Um, moving through these, we got to wrap up. Yeah. What are things a filmmaker should do at festivals? Well, I've kind of covered that. Um, Paso business cards, sure, they're great for networking when you can actually attend. That's why you go, uh, go to the meetings. It's hard when you're starting out. It's like to get that FaceTime, um, but you got to stick with it. The best thing about festivals is when we can attend them and network. That's, that's why they're needed. That's why we all miss them. We miss the attention to give, you know, it's spending a week just attending to our, our business, attending to films, watching films with focus. That's why we, met fe we miss festivals. But it's networking and professional development, going to the panels, going to see films, going to the social events. That's why we love to miss film festivals as they were. Where would I place Cinefest and AFI festivals? They're second, ter third tier American festivals. Um, AFI, uh, the, the event in, November tends to be a kind of like decent kind of Oscar run up window uh, because a lot, you know, it's in LA, there's a lot of the uh, Academy uh, folks um, um, go. So foreign language, particularly uh, nominated films are using AFI. Um, revenue share at film festival, who gets it? The filmmaker or the distributor? Uh, typically the distributor gets that um, um, unless you have a deal where uh, you know, you get the, if you're doing the work to get in the festivals, you might have to set, set a deal with your distributor and, and carve out those rights for yourself or make them non-exclusive um, at the very least. So any of the festivals that you are servicing, you get the, the fees from those. Um, but distributors in Canada charge film festivals uh, fees. I think we, uh, yeah, the Festival Montreal is Festival de Film sur l'art, and that's l'art, that's true, FIFA. Uh, piracy, um, I'm the uh, incredible film festivals. You don't got to be concerned about piracy with the online stuff, um, but you do got to be concerned uh, in vet festivals. Um, and then uh, I'll let Telefilm answer any questions specific to Telefilm stuff, although all that is online on, on, the, on the Telefilm Festival's website. What's a good goal for the, for the end of a short film festival run? Well, you're going, you want to be online somewhere, right? Um, even if it's on Vimeo, if you don't work, it doesn't work out with sales. So um, you want to have that, where are we going to be? So that, you know, you're building towards something. Yeah, Vimeo staff picks is good. Um, and there are so many now, VOD um, um, opportunities for shorts. Again, you want to use the festival window to build up and drive attention uh, uh, for your VOD. My ball's good. Fortunately, I mean, none of the monetary options are very good. I'm finding with the VOD platforms, they don't offer very much. And, and but short films are more about career development. Um, you know, like 
New Yorker off offers like two thousand dollars. I know you might get three, four, five at the highest end for a short film sale. Really, not more after that. And we're a little late. Um, I think I got through all the questions and I talked a lot. Uh, so if anyone wants to jump in now and, and wrap up, I th thank you all for, for listening to my rambling here. I hope I didn't move too fast for our interpreters. And, uh, and as always, uh, a joy uh, spreading what I know uh, about film festivals and sharing that with you all today. And good luck, good luck. Sean, thank you so much uh, for, for doing that. Uh, and just want to take a, a quick moment, thank the interpreters uh, for, uh, for their work today. And thank you to the community for, for coming and asking these, uh, these questions. Um, to Sean, I think, uh, Sean, thanks so much for, for coming again. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, you can sign up for our call for entries email at telfilm.ca as Sean as was mentioning. And there's a, a lot of information there as well um, to, to answer some of the telefilm questions that were coming up in the, in the Q and A. Um, but again, thank you so much. And, uh, and I think this was great. It's going to be, uh, we, we will put this on the YouTube uh, channel and on telefilm.ca as well uh, in the coming days. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.